first talk of the day. He'll talk about worst case analysis, our strength is our weakness. So I warned Tim I was going to give, you know, while there'll be some technical content, more of a cultural sort of talk. Uh, hopefully it's in order to be a bit more offensive than the panel, um, or at least to get people thinking. All right, so uh, sort of carrying on from the, the panel yesterday, I mean, it sort of goes without saying that although we're trying to look at beyond worst case analysis here, worst case analysis is clearly our friend in, in theoretical computer science. It's sort of the arguably the defining characteristic of, of the field. Um, and it's clearly dominant for you know, a multitude of reasons that people have expressed here. You know, it's suitability for mathematical analysis. It really is often the right way to look at a problem in, in many practical situations. And I would also say, although this maybe hasn't come up, uh, that I think, me, particularly in the beginnings of the field, it sort of culturally differentiated us. Uh, from others, which I think was probably important in sort of getting theoretical computer science to, to take off or be respected as, a, as an independent entity. Um, but in some ways, its success is also limiting to us. It sort of focuses us in a way of looking at problems that may not always be the right way to look at the problems. Uh, and that's really, again, clearly what the whole workshop has been about. Um, and the other way it sort of limits us is that when we think about well, you know, we're not getting the sort of answers we want. How can we expand ourselves out? We really tend to look for things which I would call just variations of worst case. It's sort of like, well, worst case, and let's add a knob, right? So competitive ratio, and instance optimality, resource augmentation, even FPT type stuff. I sort of view under that lens that there's still sort of worst case analyses with something additional added. Um, so to sort of set off uh, a way of thinking or controversy or, or uh, something to, to get us thinking about this. Um, so a, a couple years ago, uh, Jennifer Rexford wrote this, I think, really interesting article actually about my 10 favorite practical theory papers. So Jennifer is a, a very uh, well-known, highly respected person in networking at Princeton University. Um, certainly not unfamiliar with theory and I think many of us are not unfamiliar with her. She gave one of the tutorials at Stock or Fox or one of those uh, a few years ago. So certainly someone that, that we could go back and forth. And I'm not going to go over all these 10 papers, although I do really encourage you to download and look at, look at the article. Um, but just to, you know, we'll, we'll look at them. In her abstract, you know, she sort of says, it's like, look, you know, theory is, is great. You know, it's, we've got this networking research. Uh, sometimes you can just really find this right way of looking at it through a theoretical lens that really just, you know, bang, it really gives you power to solve the problem. Um, you know, that sometimes there are people in practice, sometimes there are people in theory, but sometimes these things really come together and, and it's amazing. Um, and, you know, I, I certainly believe that and, and think that's true. Um, so hopefully now everyone's read this because I don't want to read it to you. But <laughs> um, so here's you know, there's the first five, and then I'll go through the next five. And you know again I'm not going to sort of outline what each of the papers is about. I, I encourage you to to look at her paper yourself where she sort of summarizes these things. But one thing that sort of I, I think stands out and glares at you uh, in the audience is that. Uh, many of you probably don't recognize most or all of these names, and they're certainly not what you think of as being venues for theory-type publications, right? or even theoretical-type publications, necessarily. Um, right? And so you know, on the next slide, uh, you know, maybe you see a few more names uh, that you might recognize here. Um, uh, you know, not just me, but uh, you know, uh, some, of, some of the others there. Um, but again, it sort of lacks on what, what we would typically think of as a community as sort of being our pride and joy for, for theory, okay? And, you know, to me, like, this, this sort of says something. And so what are, what are the lessons that I think we can try and take out of, of you know, someone who's a top, well-known computer scientist, you know, that, uh, you know, so what are the lessons we can take out of this? First off, there's sort of the obvious one that I am shameless, you know, everyone knows this, I, I blog, so... You know, it sort of stands out right there. Um, of course, the other thing you might take out of this is, you know, Rexford clearly has some impeccable taste. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe the, sort of the other point is that, you know, something, there's some sort of disconnect here that, that, that we in theory are, are missing something, right? And, and I want to be clear, 
then I'm not saying I agree with Jennifer's choices or her point of view, right? I mean, I think this is something one could clearly argue about and, and say, well, you, didn't you forget about this, this, and this? Um, but to me, it's sort of uh, disappointing reading this and not see, seeing that someone who's respecting the field, that this is their view of what you know, theory is, and it's not what we're doing for the large part. Yeah. Um, and so, so I view that as a cultural problem, right? And we can argue about whether it's our cultural problem or their cultural problem, but it's a, a cultural problem that, that should be thought about and, and addressed. And one of the things, if you do go through this list of papers and sort of look at them, is that they really aren't as a whole focused on worst case analysis. Right? What they're focused on is coming up with a good workable solution to a good workable problem. Okay. And maybe that's, you know, I wouldn't want to say that that's the characterizing feature of these papers, but it certainly seems to be a theme throughout these papers, um, which suggests, again, that this workshop is a good idea, that, that we really are maybe missing something, and this is something that we need to look at. Okay. So uh, Tim sort of asked uh, yesterday in the panel, like where are things where theory could be or where are things that, that we could be doing? I, I, I didn't want to put this because I had this slide already ready, but uh, sort of a different way of thinking is things where theory, you know, things that seem to be growing and important and are major impetuses in other areas, uh, where I think theory has sort of been behind the curve, where you know, essentially our job has been, it's like, oh, they're doing some interesting stuff over there, maybe we should look at it, and maybe we have something to say after it's already, you know, sort of taken off and grown big in, in some other area. Uh, and these are, these are some of the, the, the things that, where I, where I think that comes in. Um, you know, and, and again, these are things that from other fields' point of view are theory, right, whether they're our way of thinking about things in theory or, or their way of thinking about things in theory, it, it really is theory. A lot of these things come from maybe the double E side of theory, um, you know, but I think they're all things where people in theory have, CS theory have worked, um, but we really haven't been in the lead and I don't know why. I think it's sort of, you know, maybe sad and frustrating, um, but honestly I think a big reason is because these sorts of work tend to, to focus more on statistical analysis, on a, on a sort of randomized analysis, that they don't start with a worst case analysis view. And, and because of that, we come late to the party uh, in terms of uh, what we can offer. And that's not the way I think of theory and not the way I want CS theory to be. Okay. So uh, two points I'm gonna try and make in this talk uh, the first one, I think, is, is more controversial. The second one, probably less so, and is really sort of the theme of the workshop, is that uh, you know, part of the, the culture on, on our end is, is that I think that uh, we don't always promote an environment where this sort of work, we're working on real world problems uh, and addressing real world issues is, is really appreciated, um, when, particularly when it comes at the expense of a more formal analysis. You know, at the same time, formal analysis, as we people express in the panel, is what we do, right? So I'm not saying that we should all give up on proving theorems and doing a formal analysis. We should certainly be at the same time expanding our tools. Um, but we can, I think, do these things come at it at both directions uh, and improve the way CS theory works or functions or relationship to, to the rest of CS and the sciences in these ways. Um, so. Uh, in the rest of the talk, I'll actually give some more you know, semi-technical context, uh, context for this, giving sort of two examples, um, some work I've done on heuristics, uh, and you know, some more understanding of what, uh, what we can look at in terms of random input type analyses. <coughs> All right, so uh, the two things that I'll talk about are, again, some of my work on heuristics and some of the works that I did uh, with Salil Vanon sitting in the back uh, about hashing and entropy and how we can use that to analyze systems. Um, all right, so uh, we talked, we had a fun discussion yesterday on the panel about heuristics. Uh, I like Dan's idea, we should stop calling out them heuristics, we should just call them algorithms we don't have proofs for yet. Um, uh, and, I, and I think heuristics is in a particular area where 
You know, I, I think uh, Dan's right that, that when he said yesterday is that we sort of view heuristics. You know, heuristics we sort of hold, hold up our nose a little bit, um, and uh, you know, I, I did some work in heuristics, and I think I entered when I, the project that, that I got involved in with that sort of attitude. It's like, okay, I'll take a look at this. You know, maybe there's something funny there, but you know, you guys are working on heuristics. That's not real stuff. You know, and um, but af after working on it a bit, you know, I, I left with a lot more respect. Uh, that in particular, even if they can't always prove things, right? That there's significant thought that goes into it. And specific, what I call theoretical thought, you know, that you really do have to understand a problem uh, in a very deep way to come up with, with good heuristics for it. And in particular, what I think that means is that, you know, heuristics as a, as a group, because it really is just algorithms, really could benefit uh, from more CS theorists looking at it, because we have approaches and insight that I think could really help drive the field forward, even if we can't always prove everything we'd want to, to about it. Um, so the project I was involved in had to do with human-guided search. Uh, and so I started uh, on something called human-guided taboo search, for those who know about, about taboo search. It's a little of fun. But it ended up, a lot of fun things ended up coming out of it, a uh, sort of a series of papers on all sorts of different things. And that's the other fun about working on these sorts of problems is I do think it gives you insight into, into other sorts of problems and other sorts of things. Uh, so the taboo search, right, taboo search is a basic heuristic method where it's essentially you're doing some sort of local search procedure, um, but it's local search with memory, right? So somehow you remember the solutions you've seen before and you try and push yourself into new directions, new areas of the search space, so you get some inkling. You're trying to look for solutions that aren't like the ones you've seen before. You know, the hope is that you'll target some new area of the search space and come up with other solutions different than the ones you've seen before that are perhaps more likely to get you to a new and better solution. Uh, so it's a very general paradigm. We, we applied it to, to lots of different applications. Uh, some of the cute pictures here. Um, but in particular, another fun aspect of the project that I think is, again, something else that we don't look at in algorithms is this was called human-guided taboo search. So the idea was that humans could interact with the search process. They could stop it. They could say, oh, this part of the solution looks nice. I'm going to freeze that part of the solution. You know, only work on the rest of the pieces. Right? If you think of it like, a, like many uh, problems, like a jigsaw puzzle, you could say this part of the jigsaw puzzle looks right. Focus on the other pieces. Right? And there are various other interactions that you could use to sort of guide the human-guided search. You could say, oh, go back to this solution that you saw before that looked promising and you didn't explore it enough, go from there. And one of the things we found is that human-guided taboo search, that you could really get uh, better answers faster um, than you could without the human, you know, at the cost of human time, of course. Okay. Uh, one of the fun things that came out of this, just to you know, highlight what I mean by sort of theoretical thinking, this isn't really, uh, again, anything having to do with the theorem, but just in terms of design. Uh, one of the things we came up with, which turned out to be useful from both the taboo framework in terms of how you could restrict what moves the taboo search could do to try and push it into new spaces, and at the same time be useful in terms of the human interaction and the human interface is what, I call the, what we call the stoplight framework. Uh, so those are supposed to be like red, green, yellow. Uh, and you know, putting, here the idea is you're looking at different orderings, and I'm just doing a toy example where you have the line. So the top is, is sort of the, the setting that you might have you know, that, uh, of your current state. And the three being red means you're not allowed to move it. Red light means stop. Okay? Uh, the gr ones that are green, you can move any sort of way that you'd like, right? Because green light means go. And the ones that are yellow, the five or six, you can move them, uh, but only if you're moving them in conjunction with moving a green one. Right? They don't move on their own. You can't move yellows. You have to move uh, yellow and green. So here, the sort of things that you can do are you can do swaps of any pair, swaps of any adjacent pair. Sorry, swaps of any adjacent pair. Uh, so what that means is that the three always stays in place. Essentially, you've partitioned the problem into two smaller problems. Um, and the five and six have to stay in the same relative order because they're not allowed to swap with each other ever. They can only swap with things that are green. 
Right. So this was just something that was, uh, you know, it led to a, a fun interface that was both useful algorithmically, but allowed human interaction, which is again something I'll, I'll try and drive as a, as a point later, also in the talk. Not something we in theory usually think about. We usually think about algorithms. We don't think about how people are going to use them or implement them, which is something else that I think we we could do a better job on. Okay. Um, so another aspect that came out of the work was a, a, a sort of a greedy algorithm variant. Okay? And so if there's one thing I'm going to try and get you to come out of with this talk is that uh, there's a very clean basic heuristic uh, that I really like because it's my version of it, um, but that I think should be taught in every undergrad algorithms class. So for the next few slides, I'll try and tell you what it is and convince you that it's so easy that you, you can spend like 20 minutes on, on some lecture in your algorithms class and it will be a help to your students. Okay? Um, so greedy algorithms are great when you can actually find greedy algorithms that work in computer science, we all know. Greedy algorithms generally we can think of as having two steps. One is that you order the elements, the order you order the things according to some uh, natural ordering, and then you do what we'll all just call placing the elements sequentially. Okay, so the idea there is you just say, well, I've got a partial solution. I've placed, you know, this prefix of my ordering, and that tells me now I can figure out how to place the next element. Okay, and you can also think of dynamic versions of this where the ordering itself may change according to the placements, but at each step you have an ordering. Okay, and you know, all sorts of algorithms fit this paradigm. In min packing, you can think of best fit decreasing, first fit decreasing, uh, the sort of standard greedy set cover, vertex cover algorithms fit into this paradigm. You know, you can do job shop scheduling. Pretty much, you know, when you think of a greedy algorithm, it's it's fitting into to this basic paradigm. Okay. All right. So, you know, in theory, we know. You know, we teach, or they, when I when I teach students algorithms, I start out by showing them greedy algorithms because they're easy. You can prove things about them nicely. They're easy to understand. And unfortunately, though, there aren't too many of them that are really optimal. You know, the ones that are, are really cool, minimum spanning tree, things like that. Um, but you know, they aren't always optimal. On the other hand, greedy algorithms are a common and well-used uh, and typical heuristic, right? And so the theorist viewpoint tends to be it's like, well, you know, what can I prove about it in worst case analysis form? So I think, okay, well, we'll do the competitive ratio. You know, how far from optimal can greedy be? And sort of culturally, you know, it was something, uh, well, I've been on the record as, as somewhat objecting to in the past, so it's not, not going to be a surprise. So, you know, a problem I see is that competitive ratio becomes the new metric, right? So, you know, you start thinking in the theory terms of, well, how can I improve the competitive ratio? How can I get the three down to a two or a log squared n down to a log n? And, you know, we can argue about whether for specific problems, whether that's interesting or uninteresting, um, but in many cases, I don't think that's the right abstraction to what ostensibly we're aiming to do, which is to find a better solution to the problem, right? Not to actually find a better competitive ratio, right? We're using competitive ratio as a proxy because it's not optimal, but improving the competitive ratio does not necessarily get us to improving you know, what, what the actual problem is people want to solve. Okay, so here's a different way of thinking of, about greedy. Uh, uh, which is that, you know, the, to me, the problem with doing a greedy algorithm is that you, know, you run it once and you're done, right? You say, here's my greedy algorithm, I ran it, here's my solution, there it is. You know, what do I do now? Well, you're done, that's it. There's nothing you can do, okay? And you know, naturally, you might think it's like, well, you know, the greedy algorithm took you know, 0 0.01 seconds. It's very fast, even for big problems. You know, I happen to have maybe a full two or three seconds on hand, or minutes or hours even. You know, what should I do next? Okay. And a very simple thing that you can do is to consider randomized greedy algorithms. Okay. So instead of just thinking of the greedy order, right, you should think about other orders. Now, typically, if you're greedy design had a, had a good design, like there was a reason you sorted them in that order, that means that you don't want to just do an arbitrary order. You don't want to place the, place the elements according to some arbitrary order, but maybe you want to try something that's close to uh, the greedy order, right? So sort of an older standard, something that's been around for a while, is sort of a, a, a simple version you can think of as top K, 
Uh, choose the next element just placed uniform, you know, from uniformly from the top k according to the sorted order. Um, and there are variants of this, and, and we were actually looking about this and sort of came up with our, our own idea independently. Um, you know, so it's then found the, some of the other work like top k. Um, but my version, which is I, I think hasn't caught on because it has such a bad name. People have told me it's a bad name, so I should have just come up with a better name. But it, I, you know, we call it a bubble search. Okay. So the intuitive way to think about bubble search is you can just say, look, uh, I want something close to the greedy ordering, but I want to perturb it in some sort of natural way. Uh, so I'll flip a coin, right? So I'll pick the top one with probability a half. And if it's, you know, if it's heads, I'll take it. If it's tails, I'll go on to the next one. Flip a coin. If it's heads, I'll take it. If it's tails, I'll take the next one. And so on. Okay. Um, and you can implement this easily in different ways. You don't have to actually flip the coin. Um, and so you find the element to place. You place it, and then you still have your sorted list, and you start over again back at the top. And uh, one thing that's not too hard to see, uh, the reason we call this, this bubble search, uh, is if you sort of pick your coin so that it's heads with probability p, um, the probability of choosing an ordering is, uh, well, it's 1 minus p raised to, to this distance, or it's proportional to something, that's 1 minus p raised to d, where d is the Kendall tau distance. It's the bubble sort distance between the original ordering and the ordering you end up with. <laughs> right? So it's a bit more general, I think, than the top k. You can get any ordering. Right? So it's, right, some of the properties of, of bubble search is that you, know, you can get any possible ordering, at least uh, in theory. You're not limited like you are in the top k orderings. Um, both of the algorithms are uh, fall into what are called anytime algorithms. You can just keep running it till you feel like stopping and take the best solution you've seen so far. Right, so you, uh, it just keeps going until, until you no longer want to run. Um, but the key is that it's really trying to follow the intuition behind the greedy ordering, uh, but in a much more flexible sort of way. Right, sort of take advantage of all the time that, that you have available to you. Um, and you know there are other variants and things discussed. One thing that tends to be useful is instead of you know in fixed priority algorithms where you don't change the ordering dynamically, uh, something cool you can do is when you find a better ordering, you can make that your base ordering and keep going from there. That seems to have better performance, as you, as you might imagine. What sense is it more robust than top k? Because you can actually uh, well, so so uh, you can change the parameter in a continuous fashion. Right, as opposed to top k, you're sort of well. You could take a yeah, a discrete. Um, it's more robust in the sense that you really can get deeper. You know, if if uh, you're doing top three and it turns out that your best thing to do is to take the fifth one first, you're you're, you're sort of screwed, right? Um, but uh, you know, in, in ours, you might get that a, a much smaller probability of the time, but eventually you're going to get there where you're going to take the fifth one first. Okay, um, so I have to say, you know, although I, I've used it for things, I, I certainly don't think I've been successful in promoting this as the thing everyone should try. Uh, on the other hand, on the, on the for the people who I have gotten to try it, they always seem to be, you know, surprisingly, you know, or they're just surprised that it's like, oh, this kind of works. It, you know, found things a few percentage better than our greedy solution, which was otherwise sort of hard to beat, uh, you know, quickly, you know, in, in a few seconds. Um, now, the reason I claim that this is the heuristic that you'd want to teach in your algorithms class, as opposed to, you know, some of the other sorts of heuristics, is that this is just brain dead simple, right? I mean, you know. There's not much more to the explanation than what I just presented here, right? You can spend a few minutes thinking about how you might code it up efficiently, um, but it's not hard. It's very general, sort of anywhere where you have a greedy algorithm heuristic, you can plug this in. And in fact, when we implemented it, we sort of implemented it as a wrapper. We just sort of said, you know, create your, uh, create your, your optimization functions, your placements and, and sorting functions, and just hook them into this code, and it will do it for you. Right? So all you have to write is you know, the sorting, uh, give the sorting routine and the, um, and the placement routine, and you could just plug into our code, and it would do the rest for you. Um, so it's just an additional layer that you can implement on top of Greedy. Uh, and in that sense, it's also simpler than other heuristics, which are certainly more powerful. Right? You know, I, I wouldn't want to say uh, that, that uh, 
you know, there are certainly more powerful techniques when you go to heuristics, taboo search, and others. Um, but it's something that's very general, very easy, and for many problems, if you just want to say, oh, I just want to see if I can get something a little better quickly, this would be the way to go. Okay. Um, and this is sort of the, the aside, you know, also why I think it's a useful thing uh, to, to put into something like an undergrad algorithms course, right, is that, and this came out also in our, our panel yesterday, theorists think in terms of computational resources, right, primarily like what's the running time, what's the computational complexity. Um, sometimes we also think about space, right. Um, you know, I also like to teach the way I like to phrase in my undergraduate class is that correctness is also a resource, right? You know, I can get you an answer that's really, I can get you an answer really quickly, um, but it might be really wrong, right? On the other hand, if you want an answer that's really correct, it might take longer, right? And uh, they sort of balk at the idea, but I think that's a great fundamental idea to teach students in an undergraduate algorithms class. It sort of stretches their mind uh, in an interesting way. Um, but the one thing that I don't think you know, uh, we think about uh, and, and that the other side, you know, the, the system side, hasn't maybe expressed to us in a clean way is that one of the most important resources is programmer time. Right? We tend to think of coming up with the best algorithm, the computer time. Computer time is cheap these days. Right? You know, uh, you know, the programmer time can be what's expensive. Um, and you know, so we, one of the things we should think about is things that are easy. Right? And one of the things I liked about bubble search was that it was easy. OK, so uh, this is the paper, if you want to ever look for it online. Uh, okay, so what about the theory of bubble search? And, uh, sadly, the truth is I just don't have one, right? Um, I don't know how to try and think about this idea, you know, th that if you have a greedy solution and you perturb it, what can you say about it? I mean, you can imagine various theoretical tacks, maybe the, the competitive ratio, you could say something about uh, that for certain algorithms, the you know, thinking in smoothed analysis type terms, you could say, well, the greedy solution is bad in terms of competitive ratio, but when you look in a neighborhood around the greedy solution, according to perturbed sorted orderings, the competitive ratio has to go down because there has to be a better solution nearby. Right? I would love to find a problem or a general class of problems that I could say something like that was true, um, but I don't know how. I think it's an interesting thing to try and think about. Uh, yeah. So if you, if you look at the slide uh, that you had about uh, famous uh, about very powerful theory results from other disciplines, like mm -hmm. belief propagation, capital propagation, I don't know all of them well, but the ones that I do know were proposed by someone who was already famous. <laughs> and so the thing, the thing in theory is, if you look at the theory best people have watched in the last 10 years, you'll find lots of them by people who are known. And uh, uh, suppose instead of you, someone who's then a first year assistant professor with less name recognition wrote the same paper on heuristics, would they be able to get the same attention? On hur heuristics? On heuristics. Because somehow, when you can prove a theorem uh, which is very concrete, it doesn't really matter who proves it. So if I can come up, uh, for example, tomorrow if I can improve the standard trees from 1.39 to 1.1, it's going to get uh, published in small forms. But if I were to come up with an alternative belief propagation and I'm not well known, would it? If it if it does a lot better, so so I I would liken it more. So uh, Dan will forgive me for this example. So when we published our coding theory stuff, right, we got a lot of pushback from the coding theory community. They were like, "This is." Uh, I went and gave a talk, and a very famous coding theorist told, you know, in the middle of the talk while I was up in front of people, you know, told me that the work was total crap, that they had done this, like, you know, that Reed Solomon code solved this problem 30 years ago, that I had no idea what the performance of Reed Solomon codes were, that, you know, I was clearly mistaken, right? So, um, and, you know, right, so I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't famous in that community. Um, you do a little bit more 
Yeah, yeah. You, uh, uh, you know, right. It, you have to you have to justify that your solution is good, right? So you'd have to show that it works on a lot of problems. And so on. Uh, you know, so the the human guided taboo search was published in AAAI, right? I don't normally publish in AAAI. You know, my co-authors did and sort of knew the ropes and knew what they were looking for, right? But the way we showed that this was an interesting idea was we did a lot of experiments. Um, and arguably, uh, that, that may be one of the things that you have to do to come up with. So what's the killer experiment for bubble search? Um, like, when so, you teach this, what do you show? Um, so, so I actually just sort of give them the paper and, and sort of let them look at the, the, the things that we did. So something fun that uh, uh, someone at Harvard did online where they were packing like music into CDs, right? So this is just this is just a bin packing type question, and you know they found yeah you can do it greedily and you get really really well right you get 98 percent full, right and you throw bubble search at it and you get like 99.5 percent full after you know a few just very small amount of work, right so you can argue about you know this is, this is sort of an argument it's like if your greedy solution is already doing good do you really care about the extra you know 98 percent to 99.5 percent I think the answer is yeah for a lot of problems you really do uh, so Norman Ramsey did that and it's uh, good look he has some really fun uh, Haskell code that I can't even interpret it does. Um, all right, so, so by the way, I don't have a theory, but I'd be remiss in saying, you know, there's this great line of theory we haven't talked about here about uh, priority algorithms, this framework uh, set up by Alan Borden and, and many people that he's worked with that tries to look at, you know, greedy algorithms, your priority algorithms, he calls them, what you can and can't do in this framework. And in some sense, you can think of this theory question as being exactly in that framework. You know, so you have randomized priority algorithms in this class. Can you say anything about what they can or can't do? Um, uh, okay, so just to close off this part of the talk, you know, there's, you know, Strangely, the other thing I found out is like there's this whole field of heuristics, right? We never see them or talk to them because, you know, they don't publish <laughs> theorems that get into Fox Doc. But they 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 do work in trying to actually come up with solutions for for problems that that you know they found interesting or people care about. And it really is hard to prove rigorous results. I mean, people have tried. There's certainly been work on trying to prove things about heuristics. Uh, the one that always comes to my mind, because it was while I was in grad school, was the Go With the Winners paper by Umesh Fazarani and who was it? What? David Aldis. Da yeah, David Aldis. Yeah. Um, you know, so 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 it can be hard, but I think it's also possible. I don't think it's by any means impossible. It's something that you know that we, that we can try and do. Um, but even if we can't prove things, I certainly think that there's plenty of ways that we could give guidance to the area both by coming up with new heuristic methods, both by coming up with ways of telling them it's like, look, you know, this really isn't a good direction or good approach because we can show that anything you can do in this model, you can do at least as well or equally well or some notion of as well in this other model. So trying to judge, provide, understand, and compare different methods. Um, or again, you know, trying to come up with explanations of why things work. Um, why these methods work often better than our, our solutions, even if that means throwing in some you know, strong or bizarre sounding assumptions just to get some insight into what's going on with these things. Okay, so, um, so the second part of the talk, I'm gonna uh, talk about some of the work again they did looking at the issue of uh, randomness. Um, you know, and this is something I brought up in the, in the panel yesterday, right? CS theory, I think, sort of starts with worst case analysis, and then maybe afterwards, as an afterthought, says, well, okay, we can look at these random cases. They're probably interesting too, um, uh, which is, you know, sort of funny just to me because, again, many other fields seem to sort of go the other way, you know, coding theory and queuing theory sort of being the obvious ones, but, but others as well. Um, right, and, you know, this is, you know, sort of, basic stuff, you know, what we've been talking about. Many settings aren't modeled well by worst case, um, but they're also not modeled well by sort of the standard uniformly at random sort of case, right? The world is not, you know, GNP random graphs. Um, you know, the world of power law graphs sort of opened our eyes to, oh yeah, there are different models we could be looking at. 
Um, so clearly, you know, and this was again the subject of the panel, we need better ideas of what constitute good models or good random or semi-random models. And it's certainly a direction CS theory has been moving. It's not something that we're lacking in or lacking in knowledge in. I think, think we've been moving well in this direction. Um, so I'm just going to talk about some work I, I did with, with, to that effect, um, paper from a few years ago on why simple hash functions work. Um, and what I mean by simple is usually just a pairwise independent or k-wise independent uh, for small k sort of family of, of hash functions. Um, although our results you know, can be thought of in a, in a more general framework, that's the natural way to place them. And what do I mean by work? And what I mean by work is that you know, this was something that came up for me in grad school when I was doing the whole power of two choices thing that, that some people know about, hashing and, and load balancing. Like I would program up some code just to run some experiments and see how things work. And I would just use whatever dumb hash function was lying around. And it always, 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 well, except maybe once in a while, we can talk about that in a second, would, would behave uh, just like the random analysis, right? And at some point, you know, someone smartly asked me, well, why, right? Why should it do that? I mean, you know, it's, if you've got actual data and you're throwing some hash function at it, there's no reason why it should behave like a, a random hash function. Um, and, you know, this was something that was, that's been pretty much, uh, you know, uh, unexplained for, for a while. Um, so for me, I was really motivated by trying to understand why my experiments always ended up this way. Um, right, so uh, again, just if, if you haven't seen this, uni universal hash families or, or k-wise independence just means that when you take you know, any collection of k things, the probability that when you hash them, you get the corresponding values. You know, it looks like they're independent up to k items. Uh, and there's a slightly weaker notion of universal um, you know, but really, I think the if you, for the purposes of the, talk, uh, the rest of the talk, you can just think in terms of k-wise independence. Okay. Um, so again, this isn't a new question. I, I noticed it back when back was in I was in grad school uh, doing experiments for the power of two choices. Um, uh, I found earlier stuff on Bloom filters, right? So there's this uh, paper I'll show in a sec in the, in, the, in the 1980s where you just said, oh yeah, I use pairwise independent hash functions and they gave me the exact answer I was expecting for, for Bloom filters. Um, but in all these cases, the analysis what, you know, of it would, was depending on the fact that we were having random hash functions because otherwise it's much harder to say you know, useful things to do the analysis without that assumption of randomness. Uh, whoops, sorry. So I guess I should say there, uh, with some notably rare exceptions, uh, you know, so for instance, Siegel's work on hash functions showed how to get, you know, sort of big enough independence um, using sort of what I would call a very non-trivial class of hash functions. Right, so, so this was the paper I was talking about uh, uh, from 1989, Practical Performance of Bloom Filters. Uh, everyone knows, well, or most people know Bloom Filter is my favorite data structure. So um, um, this is just sort of a quote, you know, uh, you know, the results and details of the experiment were from hash functions, transformations chosen at random from the class uh, H1, uh, which is, you know, just a, this way of saying it, it's a universal two class of hashing functions, sort of the basic pairwise independent style hashing functions. Um, so we can just theoretical performance under a random function? Or? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. He's saying that, you know, I use these hash functions and it exactly matches my theory, which, by the way, was for random, which was for random hash functions. Um, okay, so. Uh, in fact, if you go to sort of a worst case analysis, um, you know, simple hash functions just don't work. There's been a, a bunch of work of this sort recently, a lot of really good work. Um, uh, the recent work on linear programming by uh, Pog, Pog, and I forget who the R is. I should have checked all these things before I gave the talk. But, um, that show that for pairwise independent hash families, you can prove that linear probing hashing performance is actually uh, worse than random. Um, you know, as part of this paper, we showed it wasn't a, a 
difficult thing, but we were able to show that um, for any k-wise independent hash uh, families, you can come up with an input set where it's provably worse than the random analysis. Um, you know, there are other problems you could look at, um, but the whole point is is that worst case doesn't match what you actually see when you you run these things. And so the question is, you know, why is that? So this is a again sort of a data modeling issue, right? So what you'd like to do is just say well, maybe I should just model the data as being random. That sort of solves all my problems, right? If the data is random, then the hash values are random, and you're done. Um, but that's not very uh, compelling. It doesn't seem like a particularly good model for data. When you ask real people, you know, is your data random? They tend to say no. Um, and so we're looking for some sort of model between the worst case and, and the sort of average case of random data. Okay, and the, uh, the model we came up with is based on certainly pre lots of previous models about semi-random sources. Um, the idea here is you can think of the items we're going to hash into a hash table or hash into a bloom filter or you know, hash into whatever you're hashing into as being a, a stream of random variables um, over some space. And the idea is just that each element has, still has some entropy, some randomness associated with it, even conditioned on all the previous values of the previous elements. Right? So the idea is that each element is not perfectly random, um, but even after you've seen whatever you've seen so far, there's some randomness left. You, know, you can't predict particularly well what the next value will be. You may be able to have some prediction, but not, not complete prediction. Um, and so the intuition behind our result uh, was that, well, if each element has entropy, then if you could extract that entropy, and if there was enough entropy left in, in that object, in particular enough that uh, you could get the right number of bits to, to hash uniformly into a, a random cell, um, then that would be a way of thinking of what's going on, right? You say, okay, each new element has some randomness associated with it. I'll somehow extract that randomness and I'll use that to tell me which location to put it in, in the hash table. So if I could extract, then I should get near uniform behavior. Um, okay, so, you know, so now we need to look at what we exactly we mean by entropy and uh, both, so Tim doesn't have to cut me off and because you know you'd get more out of actually looking at the paper anyway. Uh, won't go into too many details here. There's sort of the standard notion of entropy. Uh, there's collision probabilities of entropy. Uh, there's there's min entropy. You know the, all these entropies are you know, within a factor of two of each other, so it's not such a big deal. Um, we ended up using collision entropy, which makes sense because we're thinking of collisions in the hash tables. So it turned out to be the right notion of entropy. And you know, really, if you boil down our, our paper to one idea, it, it was just saying, well, look at what the leftover hash lemma is telling you. Right? It's telling you, uh, you know, or my interpretation of the, the leftover hash lemma tells you, <laughs> that if you have a hash function chosen from a pairwise independent family, uh, hash function family, and you have a random variable with small collision probability, that is, you know, suitable amount of entropy, um, then when you hash it according to this randomly chosen pairwise independent hash function, you get something close to uniform, right? And in some sense, this is exactly what we want, right? We want that uh, when we hash an item according to a pairwise independent family, it looks close to uniform. And the leftover hash lemma sort of tells us, yeah, yeah, we know that. Um, so, ah, some of the math is mixed up a little, not such a big deal. Um, so, you know, sort of the, we have some refinements or looking at that in our particular setting. You know, sort of the big idea is that we're not looking at one item, we're sort of looking at a chain of items, we're looking at a sequence of items that we're hashing, you know, each one having some entropy conditioned on, on the previous elements. And so what we need is sort of a block form of this, which says that, you know, given a block source, you know, hashing a bunch of items from that source, um, the totality, if we look at you know, all the hashes of all the elements, it's you know, some function close to uniform you know, when we choose according to that method. Okay. So really this is the right way of saying it, is that if our random source has entropy, uh, if each of our, our random variables from the source has at least some amount of, 
appropriate entropy, then we get something that's close to uniform. <coughs> um, and somehow, you know, that's, that's really you know, the main idea of the paper, uh, boiled down to, to one thing. Um, but of course, we had to do more in the paper because that would have been a short paper. And you know, we're not Levin, um, so uh, can't write those one-page papers. Um, uh, but you know, we, 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 did, we, did a, we did a bunch more in terms of improving the bounds, in terms of showing what settings it worked in, and, and so on. Um, but really, that's sort of the, the nice main idea, which is that if you have a weak hash function and your data is sufficiently random for some reasonable theoretical definition of sufficiently random, then you get something that really does behave like a random hash function. Um, and that explains why you know, these things always seem to work. Um, and you know, the joy of it, this is also very general. It works you know, wherever you're going to be using hashing. So Bloom filters, priority choices, linear probing, cuckoo hashing. You know, pretty much any place you can use hashing, you can use this as sort of a black box result. <coughs> Um, <laughs> so Salil and his student uh, improved the bounds in a, in a later work. Um, so uh, after our work, uh, Martin Dietz, Filbinger, and, and Schellbach, you know, came out with this, this also very interesting paper, which is a big warning, sort of saying, yeah, yeah, look, you know, that's all well and good, but weak hash functions also just break in some very basic cases. Um, so <coughs> they were looking at cuckoo hashing, and what they found is that you know, even with completely random data, you know, so you had some sort of universe of keys and you were uniform over that completely uniform over that universe of keys, you could get cuckoo hashing to fail using pairwise independent hash functions. And it almost sounds like it contradicts our result, but when you sort of look at the numbers or the way they were picking their set, um, uh, their key set, it just wasn't going to have enough entropy, right? So. You know, in some sense, what it's, I think of this as, as a nice warning. It sort of says, yeah, if your data has enough randomness, this idea will work. But even when it might look like your data has enough randomness, it might not. Right? You, know, you have to be careful about what that means, that, that your data set has enough entropy. Um, there are, it's sort of the number of random bits in the data, not like the fraction of the bits that are random in the data. Yeah. Sense, yeah. That would definitely be true. Um, you know, other people have certainly looked at entropy for different, other different means in the ways of, of algorithms. Um, so uh, Ali Upfall and his student, and his well, his ex student, uh, Gopal Pandurangan, were looking at entropy based bounds for online algorithms. So, you know, we're not the only ones to have this idea at all that, you know, maybe a way to to sort of stretch out this idea of randomized analysis is to look at notions of entropy and how they play into it. Um, again, it's a, sort of an interesting potential way of thinking of things for future work. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention the really cool paper that came out recently, even though it's a worst case paper, um, by Mahai uh, um, Petrascu and Mikkel Thorup on tabular hashing. You know, so if you're interested in hashing for any reason and you haven't seen this paper, um, it's about worst case hashing, but it gives an entirely new view on, on tabular hashing and uh, explains why it can work so well. So I recommend it. So certainly as an open question, you know, are these ideas more generally useful, this notion of entropy? You know, so you know, one thing I, I, I feel uh, bad about in terms of this work is that you know, because it depends on this notion of the leftover hash lemma, it feels really particular to hashing. Right? So people have said, well, can this give you insight into, into other problems? Um, and you know, maybe at the high level that entropy is a good way to view things and maybe that's the, the sort of randomness measure we should be using and, and thinking about in terms of our inputs. Um, but not directly or not that I can see in the sense that you know, it, it really is tied to hashing problems and I wish I had some way of putting this in a, in a broader context um, that I don't get. Um, um, but certainly uh, it opens up the question of what are the sort of weaker notions of random data that are suitable. Maybe there are other notions besides entropy um, that could be useful in the analysis of algorithms and at the same time be realistic uh, in terms of what they model in, in the real world. 
Um, so I don't know what my time is, but I'll make uh, Tim happy by finishing up. Um, <laughs> um, so sort of the, the, you know, the, I think the more debatable or more controversial point I want to make uh, is that you know, sort of, I think the way others view it and, and maybe our own self-perception as well Right, is that theoretical computer science is about proofs, right? This is what you know. This is what defines or, or makes our field. Um, and and I wonder sometimes if, if we can loosen loosen that a bit, right? I mean, algorithms is not just about proofs. Uh, th that's certainly a key component. It's about solving problems. Um, and, and that means sometimes maybe we don't have a proof, but we can still have a good way to solve a problem. And I think the theory community sort of says, well, if you can't prove it, that's not theory. And, and I'm not clear why, why that should be the case. Um, you know, there's certainly, uh, I think design is sort of a key buzzword I'm hearing in the academic community. I don't know if, if you guys hear that too, but uh, on the engineering side, design is all the rage. Um, and I don't really know what design means, um, except that good design is, you know, you know it when you see it. Um, and I think that theory can offer a lot in terms of helping people come up with good designs because uh, our approaches, our way of thinking, our, our proof-based mentality helps us understand things in a very deep way. Um, and even if that means we can't prove things, it often means that we understand things so well that we can you know, explain to people or lead people to better designs than they would probably come up with themselves. Um, and now the, again, sort of uh, less controversial sort of conclusion is, uh, you know, I'm on the side, as it was coming up in the panel yesterday, is that, you know, we need just lots more uh, models of it and techniques. I mean, I think we do have a lot of models. I think we have a lot of interesting. People have talked about different sorts of approaches here. Um, I do think a lot of our different models are, are worst case models with add-on, uh, with add-ons, um, you know, with some, some clear notable exceptions. Um, you know, I personally like things based on randomness. I don't know why. Uh, just, you know, uh, uh, guess what my training has led me to. Um, and certainly, you know, theoretical computer science has not been averse to introducing notions of randomness and, and using them. Um, but I think we're, we're far from done. I mean, I think if the explosion of power law stuff showed us, you know, the last decade it was like we were missing something that, you know, in some sense was right in front of our face if we had been looking a bit more carefully. Um, I do think that we need these models to be somehow tied to reality and I think that what that means in terms of, you know, how do we, how do we know if we're coming up with a good model that's tied to reality? Uh, I think, you know, some fraction of us, not everyone, but, but some of us, uh, actually have to get down in the trenches and solve real problems uh, or work with people that solve real problems and, and talk to them. Um, and otherwise, my concern is that theory will be viewed as, you know, as the followers, not the leaders, right? That, you know, our job will be to clean up the messes that other people make as opposed to leading the field ourselves. And that's, that's not a position I think we should be in. Um, and because of that, I mean, I have a very expansive view of, of theory. You know, I think we should be you know, bolder, more aggressive. Uh, again, there, there were, I think, others that agreed with me uh, or set, made this point on the panel um, that we should uh, allow ourselves to make more assumptions and take more risks in trying to come up with explanations for why algorithms work well on most inputs, um, you know, uh, while at the same time understanding that worst case analysis will still may help us in this regard uh, and certainly show us why it doesn't work well on all inputs. And that was it.
carefully looking at ground time distributions, performing statistical tests to make some comparisons. Uh, one can also imagine some kind of theoretical analysis uh, to back up with each other with those community people and jobs. Uh, I'd like to wonder after your talk about what sort of analysis do you really propose in the community when you do it to back up and over the So I really think it, it part of the depends on the context. I think part of it should be you know, more connections with that community and that we, we actually should do some of those experiments. Uh, whether it's us specifically as individuals or we find ways to farm that out to people who can do it better, uh, I think would be good. But that's something that uh, I don't think I'm, I'm the first to suggest that theory and census has been lacking as a sort of experimental methodologies for analysis of algorithms. <coughs> it's sort of a weak point. Uh, um, it's a weak point to, in the sense of, of our culture. It's also in some sense it's a, a harder challenging problem that I think this workshop is addressed. Like how do you know what a good benchmark is? You know, where should that come from? Um, you know, how do you do an evaluation that's fair? Right? I mean, I think it, you discussed uh, in your talk, you know, you had code from different sources, from different groups working on it. You know, can you call that a fair comparison? You know, at some point you just have to bite the bullet and say, well, there's this code, there's this code, we ran it against each other, what else could we do? Right? But uh, I don't think that's something that we have systematized. Um, on the other hand, I don't think that should be an impediment to good ideas getting through. Right? I, mean, I think uh, if you have uh, a good novel idea, if you have a good promising direction, um, you know, even I think if your uh, experimental evidence is limited, uh, other people will hopefully see the good idea and pick up on it. But I agree with you that you, you know, if you have none, you're sort of you're facing the fact that it will be hard for people to, anyone to get if you work seriously, you're trying to claim that your algorithm works better than this other class. I just want to try a couple of additional um, interpretations of some, of some of the things you're saying. So first, in the, the Rexford list, the thing that actually stood out to me most was that the um, Papers by people like you, mainly the two papers by you, were actually survey papers. And maybe one takeaway point from that list is that one way for your community to have more impact outside is to be doing more survey writing, doing more value on, on that part of the um, And the second thing is um, on the another takeaway point was, you know, it's a it's uh, clearly would be a good thing if it's a good thing if, if you know, uh, there are theorists and more theorists doing uh, some bit of work on real problems and, and, and you know, doing some of the, the other you know, work outside of just proving theorems. And conversely, from a practical <coughs> it's a good thing that people outside of theory are, are, are doing some math and, 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 and proving theorems and doing a bit of, a bit of theory. Um, but maybe um, the, in terms of where work is published, the, the, the partition of the venues maybe has a lot to do with, and, and for good reason, um, with how one evaluates quality uh, of work and the standards for work. This relates to the point that Kevin was just making, that um, maybe it's difficult to have single venues that can do a good job in evaluating many different types of contributions. So while it may be good for the same people to do multiple kinds of work, maybe we do need different venues for different kinds of work. Um, so for, for the first point, I mean, I think uh, Jennifer said in the, the sort of thing she was pointing to, to surveys, just because they, they were uh, nice placeholders for the, the, the two that you're mentioning. I mean, I think the, the first one, uh, you know, the first one is really, I think, about Bloom filters, and in general, that the Bloom filter is like a really great solution, and she was just pointed to the survey, she probably could have just pointed to the, the original Bloom paper from 1970. Uh, that might have been, in some sense, more accurate. You know, I think just what our survey does was point out that, you know, these weren't like individualized instances, they were sort of a nice, cohesion to them in terms of how, 
how blue filters could be used in a network setting. Uh, and for the, the two choices, um, you know, she sort of points to the survey, but then she pointed to some other papers of mine that were actual results. So, uh, I, I think, again, it was more the, not that the survey <laughs> itself was what the, made the paper break, but the, the sort of the concept um, of, you know, that the, you know, the blue filters and power of two choices are, are sort of useful paradigms where that they can be helpful. Um, so for the second, I, 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 I agree with you that that's a, a problem or a concern, right? So how do we, you know, you know communities develop certain expertises and, and certain ways of thinking. Um, uh, you know, uh, on, on the other hand, uh, right, uh, sitcom puts me on its PC. We don't put we don't put Jennifer on our PC. Right. We, we could open things up a little bit. Um, and, and we don't. Right. So you know, the sitcom people, they know that theory is important. And you know, so they'll shove me a bunch of papers that I can't understand either. But you know, they should sit here that more geographic papers can help us figure, figure this out. Um, uh, I'm not clear that we go out of our way to say. Let's get some experiments. People really understand experiments on our committee, so we can be sure that when papers come in that have actual graph and charts and performance, because they actually took the time to implement their algorithms, that we can have someone who could you know, offer them good feedback. What? Yes. Uh, soda was soda did? The intention of soda was to have this thing that the beginning of the and all of that, mm -hmm. and some of it's lined out. and say, well, we can find some lower bound. If you can find a good lower bound, then you think you're all a good upper bound. Like we have a problem, right? Hold on, like, exactly. The the, that's the standard is to, like, the help card being uh, the sort of standard typical example of that. But yeah, more generally, right, find the linear program or whatever sort of program. They can keep the lower bound, and then you can say something. That's, that's something that's commonly done in the experimental evaluation of algorithms, right? Or, or, Arguably, that the right thing to do is to say, you know, not compare with, uh, oh, I beat this other algorithm, but also compare to, well, here are the best lower bounds we can come up with, or here's the lower bounds that we know from this technique. I mean, sometimes already done that, we think that's not a good part of the world, it's correct, and then you can also say, we can't just want to know, there's no answer. So we also have studies that have already always positive, or you're not going to have a technique, but I can't answer. Yeah, so we have classes of, that would we think of in that way. Um, you know, so, so I think that's useful. I don't know of a, you know, a general easy methodology that would see that for, for the algorithm. Uh, I just want to add it though, I think we were talking about the law of the field, because there was some very different analysis testing on 20 years ago, that we didn't have the order, and what makes me related to the And the people, they still have to come, they know that they're ready to the report, Thank you. 